Dan Bublitz Comedy Productions. My friend Dan, he's got a podcast, cause all comics need a podcast, and nobody had a podcast called The Art of Bombing, so Dan went out and bought a tape deck, who knows why he bought a tape deck, now cast don't get played on tape decks, but Dan is from the 80s, so hey there all you funny jerks, come talk to Dan about your work, tell him all about your worst times, it's The Art of Bombing. Welcome to an all-new Art of Bombing Between Bombs callbacks, where we're calling back the previous episode. This week we are calling back episode 267 with Gary Lewis, uh, who is a fantastic comedian based in the Midwest, been doing comedy a very long time, and we're going we're, we're gonna to talk about a lot of stuff, aren't we, Josh? We got a lot That's to right. talk about. Yeah, let's kick that off. So one of the things I heard on the episode uh, and by the way, you know, I, I put this in the show notes. I think it's a can't miss. It's a can't miss episode. It's 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 a staple for everyone just by the sheer volume of of experience Gary Lewis has. One of the things he brings up and it's it's valuable is about recording your sets. So I, I think everybody has to understand how difficult it was to record your set in 1986. Right. Yeah, like, Absolutely. I mean, you had to have a giant tape recorder. Could have had to be plugged in, depending on the situation. It had cassettes that you had to plug in, rewind, make sure they were clear. And then you had to press a giant button that made a huge noise. And so he, he refers to this in his set. He has, actually has a great story about about what happens while he's recording that will let you listen to the episode here. Yeah. But, Should throw you know, out the, real quick, the, if you haven't listened to the episode, you might want to go back and yeah. listen to episode 267 then come back and listen yeah. to this callback <laughs> it'll we'll make wait. more sense we'll wait we'll be right here when yeah you we're get just back. gonna take a time out that's right so <laughs> uh with gary you know he 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 goes into it quite a bit you know just just getting a recording was hard now everybody has a high resolution professional grade camera in their pocket that you know can t- easily take video as well as audio recordings well, and I think at so, the very least, you should be doing audio, especially, like you said, you have, everybody has a recording device now, usually, you know, built in with some sort of an app in their phone. So at the very least, you know, he, again, going going back to the conversation with Gary, he, he, lived, he was in a time where you had to have a big physical device <laughs> that you had to yeah. set up. Like you said, had to hit that big old record button. <laughs> right. Right. And, and that's tough, you know, and then actually accessing the material on the recording once you've recorded it is hard. You got to you got to listen back to the tape. You can't zip around by sliding your thumb on a screen like you have to you have to fast forward, rewind till you get to the bits that you really want to hear. So the fact that he went that far out of his way shows you how much he was willing to improve. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, because that is a lot of dedication. I mean, and then, you know, and, and to, to get a tape, can you imagine that? You know, we talk about on our, you know, with our cell phones, we all have cameras. And for the most part, most cell phones take pretty good video footage. And so we're very lucky in that aspect. But back in his day when he was coming up, you know, to get a good videotape, you had to like either, have, you know, have a ginormous camera or you know have a videographer come in with a ginormous camera to try to get that footage you know and then you know editing now you just do it on your computer real quick boop 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 and you can have Mm -hmm. a clip edited back then you know editing was uh (laughs) a a process (laughs) yeah so i was thinking i was thinking just you know in, in terms of of today's today's processes I, I have a I use Evernote for all my uh, notes, jokes, and performances, and so maybe this is helpful to somebody out there. But using the free version of it, you can actually go pretty far with this. But you know, I'll make a new note for every performance I have, including you know just getting up at an open mic or even an online open mic, and I'll get it and I'll use the recording feature that's built right onto the note. 
to record the set. And then on top of that, you can write in, here's the jokes that I did in what order. And then you can even make a diary of it and say, Hey, you know, this is, this is how this went. I need to cut this bit. So I like to leave notes for myself inside of that. It's all contained in one place with the recording. Oh, that's really good. Now uh, with that, well, there's another program. I don't know if you're familiar. I, and I think I've mentioned it on another podcast, but uh, I learned about a, a recording app called otter.ai, I think is what it was, is dot, otter.ai. And that's a recording that also transcribes your recording. So you can record yeah. and then it'll it'll transcribe it. So then you can go and look at what you actually said and, you know, edit as well. I don't know if Evernote does that, but yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't I haven't seen I haven't seen that, but that's a really good resource. Yeah, absolutely, because that's a good way to to really hone in on the editing part of your comedy, being able to not only listen back and see where you're getting the the laughs and stuff, but when you see that oh, this part of this bit wasn't necessary, I can cut out all these words because sometimes it's better to see the words than to to hear them for the editing part. You have that yeah. visual right in front of you where you can put a line through it and then read it without those words and, and yeah. you know, go from there. That's right. He, you know, he also brings up in his, uh, as he's recounting the stories, one of the, one of the things that he lands on is having to recover when you lose your composure, which can be really difficult for a performer. Oh yeah. You know, and it's hardest when there's no momentum. Like, I, I feel like I'm going to have an easier time dealing with somebody talking to me, a heckler, something, than just not hearing anything. Oh, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's the, the difficult thing, because then, then you try to bring the energy to it. You're doing all the work. They start to, they, they start to, to sense, they start to sense that from you. Oh yeah, absolutely. They totally do. And that's, and I've seen, and, and when you start digging a hole, sometimes it is hard to get out of that hole. And especially, you know, we we're talking about, you know, coming back after you lose your composure, you know, it's hard to, you know, there's different ways that you can lose your composure, but in comedy, it tends to be usually somebody gets angry. Uh, the comic is getting angry because somebody's heckling or whatever it might be. And when you really go off on people and you're super mean, it, you're not coming back from that. Because then not only, even if the person's being a jerk, if you don't handle it in a fun way and you just go off on them, you're going to lose the rest of the audience. Because they, right. you know, they're, they're rooting for you and they want you to put this person that's being disrespectful down and put them in, or put them in their place. But they want you to do it in a fun way comical way they don't want you to just like lash out and call them you know um, some mean name which i've seen yeah happen at plenty of shows that's right you know you can't i i don't know if this comes up in the episode but i'm sure gary would agree that you can't blame the audience can't take it out on the audience you kind of have to be in a state of nurturing parent when that happens yeah. you know <laughs> That's a great observation. I mean, it's one thing to, you know, to blame, you say, like you said, you can't blame the audience, but you really, like you said, focusing in on that last part of what you said, you can't, uh, uh, man, I, <laughs> I'm going to edit this out because I just drew a blank. Oh, no problem, dude. What was the second part that you said? Uh, like you have to stay in a state of being a nurturing parent. No, but there was the part right before that. So, so you can't blame the audience. Yep. And then you said, like yeah. it's, if, if you say it's their fault, then you'll start lashing out or taking it out on them. Oh, you can't take it out on them. That's what I wanted to highlight. Okay. So I'm going to start with, okay. Got it. And going back to what you said there, that was like a great, uh, a great observation. You know, not only can you not blame the audience for whatever's going on, you can't lash out at them and make it. You know, if you think it's their fault, you can't lash out at them. And that's something we should really highlight because when you, like I said, yeah. what we're talking about, if you lash out at them and scold them in a 
in a way that's very mean and, and, you know, disrespectful or, you know, all kinds of different words to describe it, you're going to lose that audience and you're going to lose more than just the person that started the whole ordeal. As, as, as a comic, um, you have to have control, you know, and I think any comic would agree that you have to have control of the room, but the difference is that you have to make sure that they feel like they're in control. Yep. And so the way you do that is you like, I think of it as kind of a seesaw effect where it's a seesaw of okayness. Like the audience has to feel in a state of more okay than you. Right. So yep. that's why we go in and we start with these bits about self-deprecation. I can't believe I did this. It was really embarrassing when I'm skinny, I'm fat, I'm weak, I'm dumb. Right. If, especially if they don't know you, you know, and we, we talked about this on the last callback where you're not Louis CK, you're not Anthony Jeselnik. You can't start with something where you put them in a state of not being okay. They can get away with that. And that's one of those things, but oh, yeah, you, absolutely. the professional comedian who is an unknown or the amateur have to be in a state of less okay than the audience at all times. And mm-hmm. that's what makes them feel like they're in control because they're witnessing something happen to you. And so if you, you know, through, through your jokes and your stories, and that's essentially what you're designing is that you're designing the script. So that's what gives you control. You're designing the story that they're reacting to, to make them feel that way. But as soon as you change that dynamic and your side of the seesaw goes up to more okay than the audience where you're talking down to them, uh, where you're making you're taking it out on them and they start not to feel okay that's when they turn on you yep absolutely and you know you can only control what you can control and there's some things that you can't control which you know another thing that we're we wanted to talk about is how you can't always make everybody laugh that was another thing that we talked about with Gary and we thought was a great takeaway because you'll you know sometimes you'll focus so hard on trying to make everybody laugh and you just got to remember you're not going to be everybody's cup of tea so right. focus on the people who you know are enjoying the show because when you start focusing on the one person that looks like they're not enjoying the show and you start they work- will always be there and they, and they will. You're right. They'll always be there. You could put all that focus on that, and then you lose your focus on the rest of the audience, and then they feel like they're getting, you know, they're kind of getting shafted out of this ticket. They're like, well, we came to see this show, and the com- Mr. Comedian person just focused all their attention on one person who didn't even want to have fun. We wanted to have fun, you know? <laughs> so it's like make sure you're, you're you know, not getting lost on that one person because you can't control everything. You can't make everybody laugh. That's right. So, yeah, focus on what you can. Well, I think that's probably going to do it for this episode of the Between Bombs Callbacks. We want to thank you for tuning in and listening. Uh, We'll be back on third, or yeah, we'll be back on Thursday with a brand new episode of the Art of Bombing. This next week's guest, Ricky Ramos, uh, was in studio. Another fantastic comedian here in Colorado. Uh, Excited for this conversation. He's doing some great things, both in English and Spanish. So. Uh, We had a great conversation about bilingual comedy, and uh, that's what's going to be coming up on Thursday in episode 268. So be on the lookout for that. Make sure you follow the show wherever you listen to the show, and uh, check us out on YouTube. And if you want to throw a little tip our way, feel free to go to buymeacoffee.com slash AOBpod. And if you buy us a coffee, make sure you leave a message to fire Josh. Don't forget that. That's right. Most important part. Fire Josh. Josh, you're fired. Uh, But we'll see you Thursday. (laughs) I'll get my stuff. (laughs) All right, everybody. You have a great week. Thanks for listening. This has been a Dan Bublitz comedy production. 